the Subcommittee on Management, Organization, and Procurement of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will now come to order. And I'd like to introduce our newest member and its representative, uh, Blaine, and uh, is that Lou Tamayer from Missouri. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Today's hearing will examine the state of investment management and acquisition oversight practices for major information technology programs at the Department of Homeland Security. And the hearing will also serve as an opportunity for DHS leadership to explain their plans for strengthening agency oversight mechanisms governing both current investments and future acquisitions. Without objection, the chair and ranking member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I'd like to wish a good morning to all of our witnesses, staff, and uh, all those out in the audience. And as I mentioned, the subcommittee hearing on investment management stewardship and acquisition strategies for major information technology or IT programs at the Department of Homeland Security will be examined. I welcome our distinguished panelists and look forward to hearing their testimony. Now, today's hearing by our subcommittee is the first look into the oversight mechanisms used by DHS for governing its portfolio of agency acquisition. While examining some of the particulars associated with the number of high-risk IT investments in development that are critical for achieving many of their missions, in fact, roughly $6.6 .6 billion will be spent this year by DHS on technology-specific programs deemed necessary for both administrative and programmatic functions. According to the GAO, the DHS investment review process is inadequate and has resulted in a number of poorly performing or failed investments. In fact, nearly all the programs achieved in GAO's most recent work were proceeding without adequate oversight from stakeholder leaders or detailed budget just, uh, justifications for their funding. These factors contribute to excessive cost overruns, extended project delays, and projects that are simply ill-conceived from the outset. The Inspector General of DHS offered similar observations and findings in his previous work as well. It goes without saying that funding dedicated to DHS investments will require stout internal controls and planning processes in order to be successful. We know that previous high-profile investments, such as the eMERGE Financial Management Systems Program, failed due to significant deficiencies in the agency's investment planning and contract oversight practices. I think it's imperative today that the DHS provide us some specifics about the lessons learned from previous failed programs and how we can be assured that such costly failures will be avoided in the near future. As part of the prior administration, I hope Mr. Duke can explain how exactly we got to this point and whether current circumstances merit moving forward with programs that are extensively flawed. To be fair, I know this is a tall order for her and other DHS leaders to undertake alone. And I implore the administration to become more engaged on these issues by finally appointing someone to head the Office of Federal Procurement Policy at OMB. And today, I'm hoping that our witnesses will provide us 
an updated snapshot of where DHS is by providing specifics about some of those programs deemed most at risk or in a poorly performing state. Hopefully, this will provide us in uh, such as a way forward for remedying those issues as the subcommittee continues in its oversight of DHS in this Congress. And with that, uh, I want to thank our panels for joining us today, and we look forward to their testimony. I'd now like to uh, give time to Mr. Bilbray, our ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, first of all, I ask for unanimous consent that uh, my, um, a uh, text of my opening statement um, be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, Madam Chair, I thank you very much for holding this hearing. Um, I appreciate the witnesses being here. I think that um, in the short span that DHS has um, been uh, in existence, I remember uh, um, the uh, scramble to restructure our system after 9-11. We've just passed eight years, and uh, I think it's a great time to reflect on our successes and our failures. Um, the, um, the concerns that we have uh, obviously are always tending to focus on the negative. Uh, especially in this committee, uh, because that's our responsibility. Um, we tend to be the bean counters for the Congress in a lot of ways, but mostly not uh, deciding who gets the beans, but where the beans went. Um, and right now, there's a lot of this that does not look very effective. Um, I got to tell you, the, um, the emergency response and the capabilities of the federal government to respond to certain threats are obviously one of the highest priorities constitutionally we bear. We do a lot of things and talk about a lot of things that are not constitutionally mandated. But um, when it comes to securing our, our borders, securing our neighborhoods, protecting our community at large for the common good, that's definitely one of the major focuses of our Constitution. Uh, and you may not know, I was born and raised on the border with Mexico down in the San Diego region. My district is very close to the largest port of entry in the world, land port of entry. And a lot of people forget that. And we've seen a lot of mistakes on here. I think that one of the frustrations is the, uh, the half implementation of the visit system. I think it's got some great potentials. I'd love to be able to talk about the great potentials of getting the biometrics of everyone who comes into this country legally and being able to use that, but also the frustration of not being, a, not being able to implement in, what, 12 years? How, long, how many years has it been? The exit program of the visit system. So we don't know who's left. And um, I think at the same time when we talk about that, we see the failure of the border security system. And frankly, I'm very interested in seeing that how much of that was wistful thinking or snake oil salesmen showing up and saying, I've got technology that will eliminate the need for building a fence. We've got a, um, agents that are being killed down at the border by people who are able to cross over, drive trucks, and then drive over agents. We can detect them, but we can't stop them. And a lot of that, though, is was that some kind of response to political pressure against building structures that don't worry, we don't have to build a fence and do a structure that somebody may take offense to. We can do it all with technology. A lot of that kind of question comes out to how much political pressure drove people into an assumption that technology could solve the problem when, in fact, it was grossly deficient. Um, the, the fact that we're going to address this in many different ways, I think, is, should be open and frank about it. But I think that we have um, some successes we can look at, but we also have some great failures. And I just wonder how many of those are people overselling technology or those going to technology to avoid political heat for other tactics that would have been more successful. And I look forward to open that, that um, discussion up. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate holding this uh, hearing again, and thank you for the testimony of the witness. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lukmeyer, would you like to make an opening statement? Okay. Uh, we're now going to proceed on uh, to our first panel. It's the policy of the Committee on Oversight and uh, Government Reform to swear in all witnesses today before they testify. And I'd like to ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hand.
Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. I will now adduce our panelists, and first I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Elaine C. Duke, and she's the Undersecretary for Management at the Department of Homeland Security. She oversees the management of the Department's finance, human capital, and contracting programs, including the design and implementation of all major investments and acquisitions. Prior to her appointment as Undersecretary for Management, she served as the Deputy Undersecretary for Management and as the Department's Chief Procurement Officer. Uh, Mr. James T. Taylor is the Deputy Inspector General at the Department of Homeland Security, where he has participated in multiple audits and examinations of DHS investment management policies and acquisition programs. Prior to joining DHS, Mr. Taylor served in senior financial management roles at both the Department of Commerce and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Mr. Taylor has been the recipient of numerous awards for outstanding professional accomplishments, including the Presidential Rank Award for a Distinguished uh, Executive and the Donald T. Uh, Scatterbury uh, Memorial Award for Excellence in Financial Management. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Randolph Height is the Director of Information Technology, uh, Architecture, and Systems Issues at the Government Accounting Office. During his career with GAO, he has directed reviews of major federal investments in information technology and major business systems modernization efforts. Mr. Height is a principled author of several information technology management guides, such as GAO's Guide on System Testing, the Federal CIO Council Guide on Enterprise Architectures, and GAO's Enterprise and Architecture Management Maturity Framework. And uh, I understand that you're accompanied by Mr. Hutton, of GAO's Acquisition and Sourcing Management Division. I welcome you. And I ask that each one of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and to keep this summary under five minutes in duration. And your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And uh, we, yes, we recognize uh, our member, uh, Mr. Cuellar, and thank you for being with us this morning. Okay, I'd like to ask Ms. Duke uh, to please proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee. I really appreciate the opportunity to come before you today and talk about this very important topic, not only to the Department of Homeland Security, to our, but also to our country. And uh, we do indeed, Madam Chairwoman, have lessons learned. And I'd like to uh, look forward to talking to you about how DHS is strengthening its oversight of all its acquisition programs, including its information technology programs. Um, in, in talking with you this morning, I'd like to talk about where we were, where we are, and where we're going. In the aftermath of September 11th, Congress created DHS to provide a central point of command for securing our country and citizens. In March of 2003, we opened our doors and combined the efforts of 180,000 people from 22 agencies and several newly established offices in the DHS headquarters. In March of 2003, the IT infrastructure for DHS included multiple wide area networks with overlapping and redundant system circuitry, each with its own network operations center and security operations center. The infrastructure had 24 different data centers and multiple independently operated email systems with multiple address lists and help desk services. There were multiple sign-on systems and policy and no secure data transmission capability. This non-unified networking made communication and information exchange across department enterprise arduous and costly and inhibited our mission success and timeline. We are focused on this operational area in unifying and consolidating and modernizing. 
However, we, re we understand that this is more than connecting servers and running cables. It's also accomplished through good program management and acquisition oversight. To strengthen the institutional approach to acquisition and IT investment management, DHS established the Acquisition Program Management Division. This office is responsible for the overall coordination of acquisition, oversight, and policy within the department, with the DHS Chief Information Officer providing the leadership in the oversight of the information technology programs. We have dramatically increased the formal acquisition review boards we hold in the department. In fiscal year 2008, we held eight formal board meetings. In fiscal year 2009 to date, we have already held 28, including eight specifically focused on American, recovery and Amer American Reinvestment and Recovery Act spending. We will also ensure our IT programs are developed in accordance with the uh, Office of Management and Budget Federal Enterprise Architecture Guidelines through our Enterprise Architecture Board, or EAB. This EAB assesses each IT program and, and its contribution and alignment with the Homeland Security mission. Additionally, our CIO reviews all uh, acquisitions, uh, purchase requests for any IT investment over two and a half million dollars. We have made major strides in cost estimating and analysis, one of the root causes of the weakness in many of our IT programs. We have established a cost estimating division, which is part of each acquisition <coughs> review, and have also provided cost estimating assistance to over a dozen programs. We have assessed the risk of all 79 of our major IT programs and have posted the results on the OMB Information Technology da Dashboard. Um, this year, we have conducted seven portfolio reviews encompassing 61 programs. That is one of the recommendations of GAO that we've recently addressed. And in July 2009, we have issue, reissued the Information Technology Management Governance Process Catalog, providing clear guidance to the department on how we're overseeing our IT programs. Additionally, we have provided updates to many of our existing guidance created in the initial uh, s startup of the department. Um, also, we have updated existing guidance in terms of our acquisition review and have issued the Management Directive 102-1 that governs acquisition oversight and policy for the entire department. And we have revised how we're tracking action items coming out of our reviews um, in formal acquisition decision memorandum that have specific do-outs and tracking system. DHS will continue consolidation um, an oversight of these programs towards the Secretary's goal of one DHS, one enterprise, a shared vision, and integrated results-based operations. Our future efforts in the IT area include completing the Homeland Security Data Network, primary migration, and also um, re fully realizing our OneNet vision, finalizing our data center consolidation, and creating a more eff efficient and effective IT environment and greater level of information technology security to address our cyber threat. It is important to note that DHS developed and implemented all initiatives I've outlined above while simultaneously managing an existing information technology program that has grown to nearly $7 billion within the six years of the department. While we have strengthened many aspects of our IT acquisition program, we will continue to seek improvements in our processes and provide our professionals the tools they need to meet both our mission and uh, um, objectives and achieve IT oversight. I'm happy to note that the department has brought on uh, this new, the new administration's full-time chief information officer, Richard Spires. Mr. Spires and I have discussed his goals, and he is leading the department in the right direction. His focus is on a sound approach to conducting systematic reviews of major IT investments, and he recognizes the importance of his leadership as the department's CIO. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the subcommittee for your interest in this very important topic. I look forward to talking to you about where DHS is, the lessons we have learned, and how we plan on moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Duke. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you may proceed. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you on behalf of the DHS Office of Inspector General. My testimony today will focus on the progress in IT acquisition management DHS has made over the past several years 
as well as the challenges the department and its components face going forward. Specifically, I will discuss our work related to the establishment of institutional and investment management capabilities for delivering major information technology systems at DHS. As required by the Reports Consolidation Act of 2000, each year the OIG updates our assessment of the major management challenges facing the department. Given the past concerns we and GAO have raised and the fact that contracting for goods and services consumes nearly 40 percent of the department's annual budget and is critical to achieving its mission, acquisition management has consistently remained at the top of that list. DHS spends over $6 billion a year for IT systems and infrastructure to support its mission. The department's components rely extensively on information technology to perform mission operations, including immigration benefits processing, border security, the execution of response and recovery operations, and many others. Given the size and significance of DHS's IT investments, effective management of department-wide IT expenditures is absolutely critical. In the past, we identified the need for the department's chief information officer to have greater authority to become a more effective steward of IT funds. The department has responded by strengthening the CIO's role for centralized management of IT, providing the CIO the authority to guide IT investments and ensure a unified strategy across DHS components. Additionally, the CIO has gained greater authority over component-level IT budgets and oversight of IT acquisitions. This has resulted from the establishment of new policies and IT investment governance functions and a defined IT acquisition review process. However, in 2007, only 57 percent of the estimated $5.6 billion IT budget was evaluated through this process. Department officials stated that there had been a lack of sufficient DHS and component CIO staff to effectively execute the ITAR process. In 2004, around 75 percent of the federal positions within the CIO's office were filled. By 2007, that number had dropped to only 64 percent. Unable to obtain and keep full-time federal employees, the CIO has depended heavily on contractor support. <clears throat> During that same time frame, from 2004 to 2007, the number of contractors increased from 121 to 550. A combination of factors have contributed to the low staffing numbers, including the complex and lengthy hiring process that includes background checks that you've heard as a familiar refrain. Once the CIO positions are filled, so many employees have become burned out from working long hours and end up leaving for positions in the private sector. To address its staffing issues, we recommended that the department improve the CIO staffing plan to include specific actions and milestones for recruiting and retaining full-time employees. The department has since developed a revised staffing plan to increase federal positions and to augment overall staff by 236 by 2011. This increase is necessary to address the complex IT challenges facing DHS. An example of a major IT challenge is OneNet, an initiative aimed at consolidating existing IT infrastructures into a wide area network. DHS began work on OneNet in 2005 and envisions it will provide the components with secure data, voice, and video communications. Specifically, DHS is experiencing delays in meeting its scheduled completion date. Some components are reluctant, re reluctant to migrate to OneNet and have insisted instead on maintaining their own Internet gateways. As a result, DHS may not be able to reach its ultimate goal of consolidating and modernizing its existing infrastructure and achieve cost savings, originally estimated at nearly $900 million. Component CIOs also face significant challenges in their efforts to improve IT management in budgeting, planning, and investment. Because programs are often funded through direct appropriations or other sources, investment decisions may reside outside the component CIO's purview. In these cases, offices and divisions maintain separate budgets that are independent of the CIO. Insufficient staff, ineffective IT budget controls, and fragmented IT management have, long -standing, have been long-standing issues for several DHS components. For example, in November 2006, we reported the results of a follow-up audit of U.S. CIS's transformation program. We noted that although CIS had taken steps to address recommendations in our 05 report, the component had yet to finalize its transformation implementation approach. Subsequently, we found in 2009 that the large-scale CIS transformation program is being managed outside the CIO's Office of Information Technology. The CIO identified the autonomy of CIS's transformation program IT efforts and the program's exemption from normal CIS controls as an emerging internal control deficiency. In addition, we reported that the continuation of decentralized, fragmented IT program efforts has led to a growing number of local systems that are beyond the CIS-CIO's current budget or staffing level to manage effectively. 
Although the total number of locally funded IT systems is unknown, CIS field offices have reported thousands of applications that were uh, created in-house. To summarize, Ms. Chairwoman, our work with the Department has shown that there is a recognition of the weaknesses in IT acquisition and governance processes in the Department, and there has been progress in addressing these weaknesses. However, there remain structural and resource constraints that limit the Department's ability to properly plan, acquire, and oversee critical information technology projects. Thank you for this opportunity, and I welcome any questions from you or members of the subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Hutton and myself, let me begin by saying that it was about three and a half years ago that I sat before this subcommittee and I testified on where DHS stood in managing large-scale IT system acquisitions, noting that while it had made progress since it was formed in establishing this range of institutional management controls needed to successfully deliver these systems, it was not where it needed to be. Today, three years later, Further progress has been made, most notably in the last year. However, more needs to be done on a number of fronts to define and implement the range of controls needed so that the Department can successfully deliver these systems on a repeatable basis. Now, what are these institutional management controls that I'm talking about? One is having and using an enterprise architecture which can be viewed as an institutional blueprint to guide and constrain uh, the structure and the content of what these systems are. Another is having acquisition investment management uh, structures, policies, procedures that, uh, that decision-making bodies can then use to make informed decisions, not only about programs, but portfolios of programs, uh, selection, uh, decisions around their selection and the control, so they are managed in a way to maximize benefits, minimize costs, and mitigate risks. A third is having a defined system lifecycle methodology. That, that is used to govern how systems are defined, designed, developed, tested, integrated, deployed, operated, and maintained all through their life cycle. And a fourth is having the people that you need in order to execute all these things. How does the department stack up today against these management controls? The answer is mixed. For example, it has recently strengthened its acquisition and investment management approach and has in the last year possibly conducted as many formal oversight reviews of major system acquisition programs as it did in the prior five years combined. However, its new approach is still missing key aspects, such as criteria for prioritizing and selecting among competing investment options and procedures governing oversight reviews. Also, while the department has recently created a system lifecycle methodology, the scope of this methodology does not yet not yet address important topics such as key practices associated with acquiring COTS or commercial off-the-shelf solutions. Further, while it has taken, undertaken a number of initiatives to expand its acquisition workforce, particularly contract specialists, it has made very little progress in adopting and implementing a strategic and proactive approach to managing its IT workforce. Over the last three and a half years, DHS has similarly made mix, or had uh, similarly mixed success when it comes to implementing these controls on large-scale IT programs. Specifically, our work has shown that programs have been allowed to begin and proceed, sometimes for several years, without sufficient management discipline and rigor. And as a result, they've fallen short of cost schedule and performance expectations, assuming in some cases that expectations were even set for these programs. That's the bad news. The good news is that when we have reported on these weaknesses, the department has acted to correct them and, and bring the program back on track. This means that programs like Secure Flight, for example, which is the pre-screening of uh, passengers on uh, commercial flights, uh, matching their names against uh, watch list, is now being managed effectively. But to get to that point, these programs had to overcome several years of poor program management and oversight. To give you a flavor for the kind of program-specific management control weaknesses that we have seen repeat themselves on these key programs and that have been addressed to varying degrees across the programs, let me cite a few examples. They include poor requirements, development and management, inadequate testing, unreliable cost and schedule estimates, insufficient program office staffing, inadequate risk management, limited information security management, and poor performance measurement. 
So, se so having said all this, what needs to be done? What needs to change? The bottom line is that DHS must effectively manage and oversee its newly starting IT programs, like TASC, uh, TASC is the follow-on program to the eMERGE 2 that the chairwoman mentioned in her opening uh, remarks. That was a failed acquisition. And he needs to start managing these acquisitions properly right out of the gate. And for those programs that are ongoing but have not yet turned the corner, like SBI, the SBI Net virtual fence, it needs to bring them in line quickly. In my view, the recommendations that we have made to the department provide a comprehensive framework for doing this, and to DHS's credit, it has agreed with these recommendations, and we are committed to working with the department constructively to ensure that they are implemented. This concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Well, I all of you for your testimony, and uh, we're now going to move to the question period, and uh, we will all proceed under the five-minute rule. And um, I'm going to first start with uh, Ms. Duke and some of the points you brought out in your opening uh, testimony, but I want you to consolidate them and uh, be more specific. Uh, DHS has been operating for more than six years, during which you have played a key leadership role in shaping how it requires and acquires and manages large-scale IT programs. It would certainly seem that six years is a sufficient amount of time for the department to become a mature and capable acquirer and manager of IT. How would you characterize where the department stands in its capacity to acquire and manage major IT instruments? And please describe how DHS matured in developing better capabilities for managing its investment uh, portfolios. Yes, um, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's, it's important to note that, that we have three roles. We're both providing the services in many cases to DHS headquarters. We're building the, the policies and procedures, and then we're, we're doing the oversight. Um, both the GAO and the IG have talked about resource constraints. Um, we are hoping this month to breach 100 people in the CIO's office. So I think when you think about all three roles, which is doing the IT operations, um, building writing the policies, putting the procedures in place, and then actually performing the oversight, I think that that um, puts in perspective how much we really accomplished in six years. So, so what have we done um, that specifically I think is going to make a difference um, now and going forward in the iterations of policies we've done? One is we have strengthened the role of the CIO. Mr. Spires is the Chief Information Officer for the Department and has all the authorities of Klinger Cohen Plus. Um, he has authority not only over IT investments, but over IT portions of non-IT investments. And we've integrated the IT oversight into our major acquisition um, program so that there's um, a, a consolidated look at acquisition for our senior leadership. Um, our new Deputy Secretary, Jane Hall Lute, chairs our Acquisition Review Board, and she is personally looking at the IT and non-IT investments, and that's one of the reasons um, we, we've had uh, such an increase in our number of uh, board reviews. The other thing that we're doing that, that may sound simple but is really um, making a difference is each one of these review meetings we used to document having the reports and give recommendations. What we've switched to is we have precise action items that are tracked. And so for each one of these meetings, we say what the program needs to do for its next stage of maturation, and we're tracking on those, and that is reported to me um, biweekly. And the final thing I'll say is we have a new online system for our leadership called NPRS that gives the state of affairs for each program in terms of cost schedule and performance. Um, and, and that is going to give visibility continually, not only as we have these board meetings, but in between those um, in terms of the performance of each of the acquisition programs. Uh, that probably answers the next uh, question I was going to ask, that you assure our subcommittee that all IT programs uh, are being reviewed at least uh, once a year for all major development uh, milestones. 
And uh, I think that's what you're describing. Is that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, what does the new DHS leadership have to say about the deficient processes in place for overseeing agency investments? And have they established a long-term blueprint for strengthening the investment management process? And if so, how does it differ from the prior administration? I think uh, the the uh, new secretary, Secretary Napolitano, um, she came in with not only a, a knowledge of the mission um, from her uh, le leading the state of Arizona, border state, a lot of DHS type activity, but I think from being a governor and, and being in the role of managing uh, a bureaucracy, she also came in with a very, very strong understanding of how management has to uh, effectively work, not only the CIO, but the personnel piece, the, the financial piece. So she immediately um, considered me and, and the management staff as, as a key partner considering how we're doing not, not only meeting the mission but effectively and efficiently meeting the mission, including um, IT. So I think that, that her work as governor came in with a presumption that we would do everything not just to meet mission but with good business sense. And that really has put management, I think, on the front uh, burner for, for each of our uh, mission decisions and has really uh, bolstered our visibility in the department. Uh, I understand that DHS is in its planning stages of developing its new headquarters. Yes. And uh, here in D.C., which will consolidate a significant number of legacy operations and sites into one campus, and um, what assurances can you offer us that a multi-billion dollar investment like this with so many major program and infrastructure components as uh, part of its nerve center has been designed with effective capabilities and requirements for meeting the mission and the needs of DHS for decades into the future, and do you have specific uh, programmatic life cycle cost estimates and benchmarks for delivering uh, that you can share with our committee today. Yes, um, there's actually three pieces of our headquarters consolidation. There's the St. Elizabeth campus, which has gotten the most um, visibility, and that is going to be the, where the secretary and the senior leadership are. Additionally, we will keep about four of our existing facilities, um, including um, the Secret Service building and, and a few others. And, and additionally, we will be consolidating the remaining 40 or so leases from the National Capital Region into about 1.2 million square feet. So we will actually end up with about five to eight facilities. The way we're managing that project is through, through management of the chief administrative officer, we were given 20 positions to manage that project in DHS. From the, we, we got them in fiscal year 09, which is really a recognition of our appropriators that you do need the staff um, to manage that uh, appropriately. Additionally, with uh, leasing, um, because this is a GSA site, we are using GSA as our execution agent. So we are using our 20 assets to determine the requirements to make sure we have a stable program that meets DHS's uh, headquarters needs. All the work is being executed through GSA. They are awarding the contracts um, and they are managing the contracts and they have the expertise and the bandwidth to actually do those programs. Um, so I think that the fact that we have a program office fully dedicated to this in addition to DHS's uh, expertise in facilities uh, will help ensure this project goes forward. I want to thank you, Ms. Duke, and I now recognize our ranking uh, minority member, Mr. Bilbray, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me just say to our witnesses, um, as I ask questions to one member, if there's anything you want to add to it, this is a dialogue we're trying to get into it. Um, um, Duke, I'll start with you. Um, where was let me just say, where was the department coming from? And I know it predated the department to some degree and got into it, but this whole issue of the virtual fence, the technology could replace structures, and then have Boeing walk in and say, basically, we can handle all of this. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. How did that evolve? I mean, how does a, 
I mean, and I think all of us here kind of trust our lives to Boeing um, every couple weeks. Um, but I'm not so sure I'd choose Boeing to be a security force um, for the national uh, frontiers. How did that evolve into such a bet on technology that ended up going, you know, basically going bust? Well, I, I think that, that our approach to the southwest border uh, started uh, with looking at what mix of solutions do we need to appropriately um, secure the border. We call it a, a, an alternatives analysis. What mixture of people, border patrol, um, tactical infrastructure, which includes fence and roads, and technology do we need based on the geography and topography of especially the southwest border. Um, and we started doing a very systematic look. I think that um, the, the, the deviations in the program from taking a really bottoms up look ended up by the urgency uh, or were driven by the urgency of protecting the southwest border. So um, I, I believe if, if there's one fault um, that, that I can point to, to to be kind of a root cause, it would be instead of completing the analysis of alternatives and looking at what, what are the operational requirements of the Border Patrol to secure the border and building uh, up to what we buy, um, because of the urgency, there was a predisposition to jump to solutions, to, to, to jump to technology, whether it be tactical infrastructure or technology, but not really take the, the time. Looking for a silver bullet. Looking for a silver bullet or jumping to, to, to fixes rather than looking at Did the Did anybody needs. take the time to go down and look at the train, to look at the operation? I mean, the fact is I'm not against the, I, the IT application there, but anybody who's ever been there realizes that um, Jersey walls across the canyons were going to do a lot more a lot quicker than putting up towers with sensors and whatever, but there was, I hate to say this, I'm a history major, it reminds me so much of what happened after World War II when the Air Force came in and said, we don't need the Army, we don't need the Navy, you know, with the atomic age, all you need is airplanes that can drop bombs, and all the other services should be abandoned, so bet on us. And Korea, and we were actually moving towards that, Korea taught us real quick what a failed concept that was based on that. That seemed like this element, but to be, to be fair with you and with the agency, I just question how much politics was into it too. Uh, people not lighting the concept or the, the message sent by putting barriers up at the border. And how much of that influenced it? And then how did Boeing end up with this thing? I believe that, that Boeing, was Boeing was selected because what the acquisition strategy, what we're looking for is it was a major systems integrator. And Boeing, Boeing brought both the ability to, um, lead, to help DHS in determining what mixture of technologies and infrastructure go at the border and, actual, and ap the, the capability to perform. I think in terms of the tactical infrastructure, that was our first focus, the fence. In terms of technology, we are moving forward very carefully and we are doing um, capabilities demonstration to see what benefit technology can bring but I think in, in going to Mr. Taylor's um, comment that we should move carefully and Mr. Heights on new programs we are not wholesale just deploying technology across the border we are doing two small test projects in Tucson and Ajo and seeing does this technology help the Border Patrol Okay, and let me just say, I have seen technology work great. We were actually back in the 70s using ground sensors that had been developed during Vietnam, and the Border Patrol were using them back then. There was all kinds of technologies. That are, they're still using those. You don't drive a road in the border region without our guys knowing that a car has passed. Um, what about the visit system? One of the great successes is the fact that we now have the database and biometrics on everybody who comes into this country um, legally. And a lot of people forget that 40% of the people who are illegally in this country are overstays and would fall in that category. That's been a great success, but what's happened over a decade of waiting for the exit program? And I, I know my time has expired, but that's a very important. How can we move that agenda? And it appears that no matter who's the administration, this issue is being avoided, and that's the exit part of the visit program. So we know who is left, which makes it a lot easier to know who's left in. 
I, th I think it's the policy decision on exit has not been made. Um, in terms of management of my controls, what, what we're making sure is we're not spending money on a contractor until that policy decision is made. And so I do believe, uh, Mr. Bilbray, that that is one where um, we have not made progress on it. Uh, the good news from the management perspective is we're not just out there kind of doing things while a policy decision is made. So, so I think that's the approach that, that this administration is taking, is to decide what exit is. Okay, I appreciate that. And let me just close by saying this. I thought the policy decision was made by Congress when we passed a law that says this program would be plugged in. Now, I appreciate you, you get the political pressure. You got people that say it is more important for people to freely cross back and forth across that Tijuana crossing every day, that um, commerce being able to come in through our ports is more important than securing and making sure that only good things get across, that the implementation of the law is secondary to political pressure by business and, and, and political groups. So I think that a lot of these problems are based on politics, not on not on policy, as you said, or technology, but we need to separate those two and make sure that we take care of the politics and you take care of the technology. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. We now uh, yield to uh, the distinguished gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding this meeting and I want to thank the witnesses for being here. Um, I guess March 2003 is when we had the uh, reorganization, uh, 22 different agencies. Um, and I know from that time there's been a lot of good progress that Homeland has done, and I appreciate all the work that the men and women have provided. Uh, at the same time, there's been some issues, you know, some of the issues that the gentleman just brought up, uh, talking about the uh, border fence or the technology. Um, uh, you know, since I live in Laredo, I'm very familiar with it and uh, extremely familiar with it. Uh, and I've always wondered why we always try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, very familiar with the SBI, that uh, part of the other committee, Homeland. Um, but, you know, my understanding is that the Department of Defense has already done a couple of uh, pilot programs, um, got a briefing on them where the sensors and the cameras are at a fraction of the cost of what you all have invested already. So if it's worked for the military, why do we have to go out there and reinvent the wheel where it's been already tested? It's proven technology at a much cheaper price, and here we are spending uh, billions of dollars, uh, number one, on technology, and, and I know one of the excuses was Oh, we're still working on it, but don't worry, we're going to bring Team A now to work on the issues. This is when the uh, thing. So I wondered, you know, so what was this, Team B, Team C, and now we're bringing Team A in, and, uh, oh, we didn't know that it was going to be that hot on the border. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of things that came up on that, but I would ask you to look at the proven technology, and if you all haven't sat down with the Department of Defense with the specific agency inside the department, I'd be happy to sit down with you. I think it will save you probably billions of dollars. The other thing is, um, if you look at it, it took us less time to win World War II than what we have been trying to organize, reorganize. And I saw your testimony and you're saying GAO is looking backwards, we need to look forward, but we still have to look backwards to see what the problems are. We still know, um, you know, Homeland Security would have had uh, morale issues, it was what, one of the last ones, or one of the, had one of the biggest morale issues of any agencies uh, They had uh, their survey. On top of that, we look at some of the issues that we have here. Uh, I can give you specific issues um, uh, as to how you all contract and how you do this, and I can give you examples of what's happened in my hometown uh, without going to much specifics. But one of the things that I really would like to see is uh, your performance measures. Uh, I have a list of questions, Madam Chair, that I would provide. You still to have court, time. And I would like to uh, request that we could submit this for record and Ms. Duke ask Without you objection. To, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and ask you to go ahead and bring them in. I mean, but I want to know how do you measure the work that you're doing? Uh, you know, what sort of uh, indicators do you have, performance measures that you have? Uh, how do you indicate success? I mean, if you don't, if you can't, tell us what we're doing and we don't know if uh, we're in success or failure. Uh, so I would ask you uh, to, uh, and I don't, Madam Chair, two weeks, is that sufficient time? Uh, I would think so. Okay. Uh, I would ask you if you can submit this to the committee within two weeks to the list of questions that I have. Um, so I guess my statement now and my question is, 
When you hear from the Save Joe and money. the Director General, what do you do with the recommendations? What, what actually, what's the anti-aging eye roll? Because they've given some recommendations and, and you're considered an at-risk agency, which is vulnerable to fraud, waste, I mismanagement, etc. What, what actually goes through the thought process? What do you go to the report? Do you look at, look Asian at gas. upside down and say, okay, let's move on? What's the thought process? Phillips Colon. No, I mean, we test the good the reviews of, of the IG and very seriously um, in addition to the report provided by um, Most of the is um, very clear that we the findings. We might not concur on specific. And I think that when you look at the reports, um, Generally, they're saying we're moving in the right, right direction. We just have gaps still in, in the effectiveness of what we're doing. So we do follow up on our recommendations. The meat is maybe we won't do. Pumpkin and close the recommendation if we haven't seen something. Go ahead. Let's see. Uh, that said that they have taken several steps that get right at the specifics of our recommendation. But we really believe, and I think Mr. Cuero mentioned the importance of looking back. We feel that we've done where we looked at the execution of their investment reviews from 04 to March 2000. This is perfect. It just was not right of delivery. And we came up with uh, identified Combo. reasons why it's important that you look back. The perfect man. It hasn't worked in the past. Follow through the end. report now that um, I, I understood a little more fully. Um, we were moving in that direction, but um, again, the, the GAO thought we weren't making enough progress with some of the specific recommendations because we're not holding enough board meetings. We're not documenting them properly. You're not having enough meetings? Enough board meetings, yes. They, they looked at how many acquisition review board meetings we were having, the documentation of them, um, the follow-up, and those type of things. I think we've corrected that. Um, at this point, the recommendations are still open because they want us, they want us to demonstrate sustained performance and actually um, keep the system going. But I guess a lot of it was counting the, the number of, of review board meetings we had and the documentation of them. Um, you know, not not to be argumentative, but having a meeting doesn't mean anything unless you do something. You, need. you can have a meeting every day, but if people do something in a meeting, it's wasting their body's time. Um, also, with regards to this uh, report, it says that they found 14 major investments that experienced cost growth, schedule slips, or performed shortfalls. Um, have those problems? That yep, you got it, and then you bite. Um, we're, we're, yeah, we have programs we that have, are... Do we have more meetings to, to discuss it? Yeah. The, the way we're fixing problems of, uh, like that, of those type, are to have putting in place what's called an acquisition program baseline that sets... Why was it not put in place to begin with? With the, the programs were active when they came to the department, they were not in place. So we're going back and we're fixing the programs that came into the department. Those programs, we only have a few new start programs since the department stood up. SBINet, um, CIS Transformation, most of those programs existed in legacy agencies and we're trying to build a structure around them um, without stopping them and uh, balancing um, building the controls while they're still performing. So yes, it is a going back exercise. Sir. Sir, I'd like to uh, continue the discussion a little bit on the question about uh, what steps have been taken. And Ms. Duke mentioned, you know, uh, one of our points was about the meetings. But I want to add some context to that. What we're talking about is that we looked at, uh, I believe it was 48 major investments over uh, um, a four-year period. And there was already a process in place at the time. If it was applied with discipline, and for example, the programs had uh, mission need statements that were approved, if they had operational requirement documents that were approved, if they had acquisition program baselines that were approved, and DHOS was actually involved in holding a meeting, although I think it's more than just a meeting, it's, it's getting department level approval of that investment as it moves forward. That's the key. But some of our other recommendations were that two of the components didn't have their own process that they're supposed to have that's consistent with the departmental process. That's just another example. So we had several recommendations I think get at the core of some of the problems that we saw. And I think that while they have taken some steps, and, and I would agree with Ms. Duke, I didn't want to leave the impression that it was just having a meeting. 
Okay, thank you. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our ranking member. Thank you very much. Look, I want to follow back up, Mr. Duke. I don't mean to be picking on you, but it, uh, the, the issue of policy with the visit system. Um, was it the policy of the Bush administration that the exit part of the visit system was not going to be implemented at that time? Uh, Mr. Bilbrey, I honestly don't have first-hand knowledge of, of that um, because I wasn't involved in, in the policy decisions. Um, my role was more, um, do we have an actual requirement to execute? So I, I honestly can't answer that question. I'm trying to remember, but, you know, I was, I remember pretty closely when the visit system was being pushed um, by Lamar Smith and, and Chairman Sensenbrenner. And as far as I know, that was not a voluntary um, authorization. It was a, um, a mandatory implementation. And I still have a problem with why it hasn't been implemented um, unless they're just using the excuse that the technology doesn't exist to monitor those who are leaving the country. Um, or if the executive branch claims the authority to veto the legislative intent with the fact that we feel that it's inappropriate this time to implement the legislative mandate. And you, you have no recollection where the justification was that was outside of your realm. Now, I, I, I had never heard any discussions that the issue is technology or what the exit solution would look like, the specifics. And if, it, if you'd like, I could get back to you for the record on where we currently stand with um, the exit solution implementation. Excuse me? I or, and it wasn't even an issue of are we going to do exit or not. It was going to be what precisely is exit going to look like. I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what decade we come to that conclusion what it's going to look like. Um, because it is one of those situations that after 9-11, there was a lot of talk about how terrible it was that the bureaucracy wasn't doing the common sense things and implementing and overlooking and avoiding things. Um, and that's state and, and um, federal bureaucracy. But now, after all this time, to go back and say we're still trying to figure out what we want this to look like. At a time, and let me just say this, at a time that our neighbors to the south are stopping traffic and going through traffic as it comes south. Um, we're worried about if somebody may have to slow down for a, for a monitor to pick it up. And how many of us drive, drive through uh, toll booths that electronically pick up our, our data? And it seems like if it's to raise money, if it's, it seems like to, to generate revenue, the technology's there and implementation's okay. But if it is to, to regulate the federal constitutional mandate of, of immigration and border security that the federal government has, we just don't know how to implement it. And maybe what we ought to be talking about is just going to the state agencies that, that are handling um, um, toll roads and saying, you know, maybe we want to contract with you guys to do it. Because they seem to do it pretty well. I mean, I, I avoid uh, the toll road, the Dulles toll road, like the plague, but I drive next to it every day, I mean, every week that I head south, um, I'm south meaning southwest, and they sure seem to be able to get that technology working there. So uh, I want to uh, leave an open invitation that please, if there's political barriers to the implementation of the law, we need to know about it. And frankly, I think the, um, that's one of those things that we need to address. The other issue that the gentleman from Texas brought up I want an open invitation of we're going, you know, how we can do it better, where you see the system needing to be improved, because we're going to be following up on why are we reinventing the wheel when we've got sensors and technology that's been used by our military and, and our clandestine services for decades. Why aren't those technologies being looked at first rather than what appears to be last. And a lot of this is politics. Look, I've been in the game since I was 25 years old. I know how much influence of the politics is. And politics can be good or bad. Let's thank God that somebody was willing to stand up and tell the bureaucracy that we can't do all observations from outer space. We're going to try this little remote control airplane called the Predator, which has been one of the greatest success of military application within decades. But 
the politics of the lobbyists here pushing us to go and use technology unproven, the silver bullet that looks so great when someone's selling here in Washington. I think those are things we're going to address. And I leave you an open invitation as much as you can within the law and protocol to work with us so that we're not just digging through your records. You're able to participate with us so we address and, um, the issue and serve the community we're sworn to serve, and that's the American people. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Mr. Wright. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 just a couple of thoughts you, uh, concerning U.S. visit exit. I, I can't comment to the extent to which it was a policy or political decision. I'm not aware of that. The real challenge in dealing with U.S. visit exit is, be, is that the physical infrastructure was never there to screen people as they were leaving this country. It has always been there to screen people as they come in, and there are extraordinary physical space limitations for land-based borders as well as in airports and seaports too. So the real issue, the real challenge that's trying to be dealt with now with respect to U.S. visit, it's not uh, technology, it's operationally how are we going to implement this? How are we going to implement the technology? Who's going to do what? Is TSA going to do it at the checkpoint? Is CBD, CBP going to uh, do it uh, at the gate? Um, for uh, land borders, uh, how are we going to expand the physical lanes in a very constricted environment on some of these uh, urban uh, ports of entry? So that's the nature of the challenge that's being dealt with now. Okay, and let me just say this. The largest land port of entry in the world is being rebuilt today. Right. My question to you is as we're rebuilding that whole structure, putting diagonal lanes so you increase and double them up on there, are we engineering and designing into that retro that new system the exit system is that being engineered in there uh, that's, you know that's that no, I, I, I can't tell you that but that is a, a, an excellent question and that's what should be dealt with when you look at a portfolio of investments to say we invest in physical infrastructure here how does that relate to what we want to accomplish through technology uh, through the U.S. visit program, so let's make sure they work in lockstep. And let me tell you, somebody who's worked on border issues since the 70s, the political pressure is to get people into this country and back and forth as quickly as possible, and security is way down the list. And the trouble is we don't have that kind of lobbying and political pressure on, on the bureaucracy to implement the law as we do as to make sure that commerce is, is never obstructed in any degree. And frankly, as you said, the infrastructure, if, it was, if we were charging at the border, you darn well say that infrastructure would be there like that. But when it comes to securing and implementing the man requirements of the representatives of the people of the United States, it's been put off for a decade. So I guess that's one of those things that we need to make a priority. And my staff will be checking with the millions that are going into redesigning and rebuilding the border um, crossing of Tijuana. Let's see if the exit part of it's being executed. Let's see if the administration is following the law or, or responding to the political pressure. Mr. Uh, Bill Bray, we intend to hold a series of these hearings and make recommendations since we have a new administration. Uh, it's just mind-blowing when we put uh, the Department of Homeland Security together. We brought over 750,000 people from various agencies and departments who had their own budgets. And uh, we have to see that this department functions for its intended purposes. And uh, we might quote a number of years, but still we have the kinks to work out. And so uh, have faith that when we gather all the information, we will make the kind of recommendation so uh, Homeland Security will indeed secure our homeland. Uh, I'd like to go on now to uh, Mr. Taylor. And your testimony cites the explosive growth of contractor support mm -hmm. in the CIO's office at DHS since uh, 2007. And what are the causes of the staffing shortages? And um, uh, is it a cultural or due to ineffective management? I know we threw all it together. That's why I made that comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just want to know, has DHS made the significant alterations uh, to its staffing plans since your recommendations were made to do so? And you can chime in, Ms. Duke. Sure. In response to the recommendations, the department has uh, put together a plan to in significantly increase the CIO's office. And I think Ms. Duke mentioned that they're going to hit 100 
Um, the total that they uh, plan to do by 2011 was something like 236, I believe. So they have responded to that. To answer your question about why it got to where it is, um, I think there were a, a, we identified just a number of potential reasons. I mean, there has been a push historically to reduce the number of permanent full-time federal employees anyway um, and rely more on contractors in the past. Um, and, is, and also the IT area is one of those areas where we all, sitting at this table and, and, and in the federal government, have had a heck of a time hiring qualified people. So it's tough to start with because we have trouble competing with the private sector. And there are barriers still in the hiring process to make it frustrating for someone to try to come from the private sector and get into the government if they haven't, if they're not experienced with the process. There's background checks. It just sometimes it takes months to get someone in. If they get frustrated. They have another offer. They move on. With the uh, job loss in the situation mm -hmm. is now, do we see more people out there that would be eligible? Ms. Duke. Um, we, we see um, some increase in interest at especially the, the lower, uh, excuse me, the higher grades. Um, mm -hmm. So people coming out of industry with pay parity, um, you know, kind of the 14, 15 and above levels. Our, our biggest challenge in recruiting is at the journeyman level, the, the high working level, the GS 12s and 13s. And we're not seeing too much of an increase in those. But um, we are starting to see. Additionally, we're working on some uh, with Mr. Barry who's now running Office of Personnel Management on getting some flexibilities uh, with hiring. And um, the third thing we're doing, because you specifically mentioned contractors, is not only in the CIO's office, but across DHS, we're looking at the balance of our workforce. Within CIO, we've adjusted our, um, our workforce to, we were going to just about 200 through contractor conversions of essential functions. Our goal is now to be at about 325 federal employees by 11. We think we can do that with existing budget by making core functions of federal employees. It is going to be a human resources challenge to recruit um, that many people for DHS, though. Okay, let me uh, kind of move on. We're losing a lot of our time. Uh, let me address this to Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hutton. Um, I want to begin with uh, a very general question, and how would you characterize the success of DHS in delivering large-scale systems that are on time, under budget, and that meet pre-established requirements? And let me go, I guess, to uh, Mr. Hyde. You know, a very general Archie question character. like that overall, yeah. I would say the, uh, the success has been poor in doing that. Um, what we've seen is a pattern of progress, as I mentioned in my uh, oral remarks, a pattern of programs getting started and allowing to proceed for many years uh, where they are um, rudderless, basically. And then when these problems come to the attention of uh, certain principles, then they get acted on. And through many years of efforts, the programs begin to be brought uh, back on track. Uh, that, to me, is not an indication of a successful program. To measure success, and success can be anywhere on a continuum, from you know, achieving everything we possibly hoped of to achieving nothing, uh, you need to establish what it is you're trying to deliver. And you need to uh, make that commitment, and you need to measure yourself against it. Time and time again on, on some of these programs, uh, I've seen where they get started and they're allowed to proceed in the absence of any commitments without defining what's going to be done by when to deliver what kind of capabilities to produce what kind of value. Uh, if you don't have those commitments, it's hard to judge success. You can proceed for a while, deliver some capability, and declare success. So um, my, um, uh, one of the things that we've pushed for in our reports and one of the things that uh, I would emphasize is that when programs start, they need to be uh, grounded in clear uh, expectations uh, surrounding what are we going to get at the end of the day and what's it going to cost us. Uh, and, they, and then you need to measure yourself against that. Uh, in 1996, Congress attempted to strengthen the IT investment management oversight process through new requirements for capital planning and investment at reviews at agencies. Both agency procurement and information officers were charged with overseeing the following activities. 
Would it be fair to say that ineffective review processes are the cause of wasted investments like the eMERGE pro e program? And is the investment review process at DHS broken? If so, how much of it is due to inadequate attention from agency leaders? And we'll start with you, Ms. Duke. I, I think that we have a ways to go to deliver the robust acquisition review program that the, this country deserves. Um, but I don't think it's because of a lack of attention. I really think that right or wrong, when the department was formed, it didn't exist. So the programs existed, the $6 billion worth of IT investments existed, and the things that GAO and the IG are saying we should have didn't. And so programs came into the department and they didn't have cost schedule and performance metrics. So what, what we've had to do in setting up the program is go back and put those in place and then start measuring against them. So the, the result is, is that you know, things have taken time because we can't measure performance until we actually put performance metrics into place. So in a lot of the, the first years of the department, we've been in a remedial mode. Um, we've been putting things into place. And now as we put them in place, we can measure against them and track performance. But, but we have been, you know, I think that some people erroneously believe that we started out kind of zero. We started out in a, in a hole. Um, and and we, I think we've dug ourselves out of the hole, but we're not to the preciseness that, that this country deserves yet. Um, I understand that uh, Senator Carper has introduced legislation that would make significant alterations to the IT investment management process, including increased requirements for budget justifications and transparency during the development life cycle. And should we be using firm financial benchmarks at uh, DHS for determining when to pull the plug on programs with cost overruns or deficiencies beyond certain thresholds? And are there statuary changes that could be made to strengthen the oversight processes in place at DHS? Or are there problems more related to the execution of current processes in place? And uh, let me just start with the GAO, and then we'll go on to the IG. Um, Madam Chair, my, my position uh, on that is uh, you shouldn't have to legislate good management. Um, That's true. And in fact, legislating good management can sometimes be a dangerous thing to do. It can have unintended consequences. So um, my, uh, what I believe is that there are the mechanisms are in place, they're understood, uh, the, the, the issue comes in uh, execution and implementation. Um, and in the absence of uh, implementation, it doesn't matter how great a process or a, a review board set up that you have, you have to execute it. Uh, so uh, I, I would go back to um, something I've said many times, is that for a program of, of, the, of this kind of magnitude to be successful, there are literally 100 stars that need to align. And any one of those stars can have a major impact on that program. So there's a lot of things that have to be done right. Um, and, you know, oversight is one of those variables, but there's a whole lot of others in the equation that, that need to be done right. And, and the reason that some of these programs have fallen on hard times over the years is, is through a combination of these things. Um, and, and to Ms. Duke's point about the fact that um, they inherited these uh, uh, agencies, these component agencies, and inherited their programs, and hence the department didn't have its own institutional uh, ways of overseeing. That is true. The components should have had their own, and the components should have been paying attention to them, and the components should have been doing these programs uh, correctly, and that yes. wasn't happening. Thank you. Mr. Taylor? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to actually back us up. I think the, the most valuable service that a procurement office performs is helping management determine what its requirements are in the first place. And what we've seen over time is a lack of firm, measurable uh, requirements. That what is it we're trying to accomplish with this technology application? What is it we're trying to achieve? And we start with those kinds of problems. That and the, the constant pressure to respond. Um, respond in terms of disasters, respond in terms of a, of a crisis at the border. We need to do something quickly so we don't have time to really work through all of our requirements. And so the requirements change. And whenever that happens, you have serious 
uh, problems with oversight. You also have a problem where it's not so much that the department doesn't have the infrastructure identified, it's being able to staff it as we talked about, but it's also being able to follow up and manage at the component level. So we, we need to focus the kinds of authorities we have in the CIO at the department level on the component CIOs and have them responsible for identifying and managing IT budgets and staying on top of IT projects. Thank you. And Ms. Duke, would you like to add to that? No, I, I agree with, with both the GAO um, and the IG. I guess in terms of what the GAO sh said about what it should be, I agree totally. Unfortunately, uh, as the execution person, I have to deal with reality and what is, not what should be and trying to get to should be. Um, I, I think that um, we, we do visibility into the budget by the CIO is very important, and we have instituted that through our performance review process. Um, and, and I think that um, we have to put the performance measures in place, hold the program managers accountable um, and the components. And I think also we have to have the discipline to be nimble and quick because our enemy is nimble and quick, but have the discipline to not just do things fast. Um, one of the early cultural and the cultural pressures on DHS was to do it fast. And that seemed to be the measure. And we're trying to right now hold the line on doing it fast enough to meet our threat but do it well enough. And that is a trade-off between cost schedule and performance. And that's one of the biggest cultural changes we're in the midst of right now. Mr. Bilbray. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield my time to the chair. I just want to say, um, in all defense, we have gone through eight years without another major attack. So I think we can say to DHS, congratulations. Um, uh, but at the same time, understanding there's huge amounts of waste of resources, effort, um, uh, critical resources that can be used in other locations. So we have been successful. We don't know if that success is through accomplishment or dumb luck. Um, but we'll take it, whatever. But let's move on and not depend on dumb. Let's make sure in the future that dumb luck is not what we're depending on. Uh, we have a responsibility to straighten this out and try to get into it and make it as effective as possible. So. Um, uh, we can move on from there, and I yield to the chair. Thank you so much. Uh, let me move on, and um, this will be our last item of uh, questioning and information. I would like to hear something about a detailed assessment on the lessons learned from the failed eMERGE program and how we can be assured that its offsprings the transformation and systems consolidation referred to as task program will not become another abandoned project that wastes over fifty million dollars so where is dhs in developing the necessary requirements for task has the task program been reviewed by the appropriate investment review boards and developed the appropriate justifications for funding and mission needs and how did and why did we wait so long before terminating the original eMERGE program and what information was missing to determine that it would not be effective and what are your life cycle cost estimates for this program and uh, estimated date of completion. So any of you can jump in, but I'd like to start with Ms. Duke. Um, regarding eMERGE, um, the, the two biggest lessons learned um, from the original program that was done within the first year of the department it, uh, was one is it, it was a noble objective. We have severe weaknesses in financial systems in many of our components to the point where we cannot get to a clean financial audit with the current systems. That has to be corrected. Second, we learned from industry that a, a single or a shared um, financial system is essential to an effective merger. Um, and so we need some type of communication between our financial systems to be the mature department that, that this committee and the country wants us to be. What we did in the initial eMERGE was, two, I'll say, two lessons learned. One is what we took what we called the nuclear approach. We said, we're almost starting over. You know, give us a brand new system. That's the utopic system. One system deployed quickly within months of the department, and it's too complicated to do effectively in that type of wholesale, just quick hit approach. The second thing um, we learned from it um, is um, that um, 
we, we, we're relying too much on industry for the solution. So it's good to rely on, uh, rely on industry to deliver the solution and work out the specific ways of delivering, but we hadn't come up with our requirements well enough. And so then for, you're, you're at the mercy of industry to deliver whatever solution. And so our regrouping and our time has mostly been focused on the requirements. The current program task um, that is being overseen by leadership in, in significant detail. The RFP is out on the street. There will be another acquisition review board um, this calendar year to look at the, the next date. I'll have to get back to you on the life cycle cost estimate, but it's a multi-billion dollar program um, if executed throughout the department. But it does allow for a more staggered approach so that we really balance risk. Um, so it is really a total revision of the approach to financial system management. Yes, Mr. Height, please. Uh, ju just uh, a quick thought on that. We, we have ongoing work looking at the uh, task program for uh, House Homeland Security Committee and for the House Appropriations Committee. I believe it's scheduled to be issued uh, this fall, so it's, um, it, it's, it's coming to a conclusion. And what it's doing is looking at uh, the six recommendations that we had made uh, relative to uh, moving forward on the, the son of Emerge uh, 2. And so uh, we'll be able to, to speak to what the department's doing relative to defining a strategy for the program, developing a concept of operations, putting in place the means by which, the processes by which they're going to manage it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm just going to throw out some of the other programs, too, and you can, across the board, uh, just comment on them. The uh, Automated Commercial Environment Program, and uh, it did not meet its cost schedule or commitments, and the cost went up. And then another program, Rescue 21, is uh, plagued by cost overruns and so on. So can you comment on what happened with those? Yes. Um, before I comment, um, I'd also offer to, to brief you or your staff on sure. um, specific programs at, at their convenience um, so they can get a... And I just want you to know, we're holding these hearings so we can fix right. what went wrong. And uh, how do, you know, we're putting together this humongous DHS. We want to get it right. right. So what we want to find out is how we, and I don't think we have to, as has been mentioned, do it through legislation. We just hope that the leadership in the various uh, agencies and departments will be able to automated uh, improve. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Yeah. Um, automated Commercial Environment ACE, we just held an acquisition review of that. Probably the fundamental or baseline problem of ACE has been evolving requirements. It's a major system and it, we keep finding new ways to work with the shippers uh, in the Comres and so um, that's okay. It's okay for a program to evolve over time. What we're trying to do now is be more disciplined about making the cost schedule trade-offs rather than just adding requirements. And so right now we're in a period where we're having ACE reassess. It's requirements, its cost estimate, and its program metrics um, before proceeding forth with any of the planned enhancements. In Rescue 21, um, one of the fundamental um, problems with the initial part of Rescue 21 is, is there were some COTS solutions, as, as this committee's talked about, to the, the control system, and the initial um, uh, way we moved forward with Rescue 21 was to develop a, a unique uh, developmental um, control system. And so one of the things we've learned on Rescue 21 to get that back on track is we've gone away from that developmental system, um, similar to the approach we talked about on SBI Net. And that, that change in strategy, which I think is good for the program in the long run, to have a commercial system um, did cause some um, cost increases. And um I'd like to have GAO comment on the SBI net and where you see it. It was about, uh, let's see, about uh, eight, eight, ten months ago we reported on where SBI net was uh, at that time. Um, and our, our message then, it was unclear what was going to be delivered, by when, at what cost, to what locations. It was constantly shifting. Uh, what it was going to be was shrinking without becoming more specific. When it was going to be delivered was moving further out to the right on the timeline, and, and the costs were uh, a veritable uh, unknown uh, at that time. Um, 
In addition to that, there were issues surrounding the ambiguity uh, of the requirements. If you have unclear requirements, it's a recipe for failure because uh, what you'll learn over time is it's, it's very difficult to design and develop a system to a requirement that's not clear. Uh, and then if you learn about those kind of things downstream after you in fact have uh, developed software or integrated uh, commercial uh, products um, and you're trying to test them to see whether they meet the requirements, it's a whole lot more expensive to fix them then than it would have uh, at the beginning. Uh, there were uh, issues uh, associated with uh, the testing uh, at that time. Um, you know, component tests were occurring uh, on individual parts of SBI net or, I'm sorry, had not occurred, yet tests were occurring on uh, the integration of components, which is kind of a, uh, out of order. So there, there was a range of program management weaknesses associated with it uh, at the time, and it had it on a track for just flat out not being successful. Uh, we raised these risks uh, to the department. We, um, as part of our recommendations, we wanted the uh, then uh, IRB Investment Review Board, now the Acquisition Review Board, to get involved and conduct oversight of it. I'm happy to say that that has uh, occurred uh, to a, cons a considerable extent. The ARB has looked at it. The ARB has issued uh, directives, uh, decision directives to the program on what it needs to do in order to bring itself back. There's been a wholesale change in that program in terms of the leadership uh, on it. Uh, there, uh, the new uh, program director for that is an exceptionally qualified uh, uh, individual. So I think um, we're moving in the right direction there. We have ongoing work looking at the extent to which the very specific program uh, weaknesses that we identified in terms of being able to put together a good estimate of what's going to cost, a good schedule, what's going to get done when, uh, and uh, to do good requirements management, good testing. We have work going on now for the House Homeland Security on all of those fronts. Uh, we're probably about three or four months away from reporting on that, and, and, and because of our protocols with the Congress, I can't disclose what the results of that work uh, is right now. We will be exiting uh, with the department and sharing the results of that work in the next uh, probably 30 uh, to 60 days. Um, and so uh, when we're in a position to, we'd be happy to share that information with the committee as well. Mr. Spielberg? I have a question. Okay. And uh, Mr. Taylor, would you like to comment? Uh, one of the questions um, that is still rolling around among us is that when do we pull the plug on programs with cost overruns or deficiencies uh, beyond certain thresholds? It's an excellent question. The, the problem we run into with some of these programs, and you've seen it at DHS and other places, I'm sure, but at DHS we've had a problem because we don't know what the definition of what we're asking for in the first place is. We know we need to have an operational requirement that we need to support. We haven't defined what it is we're trying to use that application for and what we're trying to achieve. So we keep evolving the requirement and things change as we're going along and the costs add up over time. You saw it with, with some of the other projects. You, you saw it with the original Pearson contract before DHS's time, the original Pearson contract with TSA to train TSA screeners. You saw it with Deepwater. Um, you see these things evolving. We're concerned about the financial system for those kinds of reasons and other projects. It's, you have to require a real definition of requirements. You have to have those requirements in place so that you know what you're getting, so you can measure those costs against it. And that's the biggest weakness right now. Mr. Connolly, is there a question, a statement you'd like to make at this point? And welcome. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, forgive me for being late. I had a caucus meeting and then uh, gave a five minute on the floor, so I'm just coming back from the floor. Um, I do have an, a prepared statement. I'd be glad to enter into the yeah, record. You can submit it for the record. And, uh, just to welcome folks here, uh, obviously the whole question of the deployment of technology in our federal government is very critical um, moving forward both to this committee uh, and uh, certainly in my district. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be very interested in looking at the testimony and following this issue and I again thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you. Uh, let us now conclude with Ms. Duke. Uh, you've heard the input from not only the questions we ask, but from the GAO and the IG. Uh, what would your overall view be of the progress we have made at DHS and where do we have to go? 
You only have an hour to tell us. <laughs> I, I think my assessment of the progress varies from day to day. Um, I, I think when we look at the limited resources we've had, the challenges we faced, I am very proud and amazed at the progress we make. Uh, I, let me just say sure. this. Uh, you know, this new administration has been accused of growing government. And uh, I really don't know what that means because Here's a prime example of why we want to grow government for homeland security. It just makes sense to me. Uh, I come from Los Angeles, uh, and you really need to get there two hours in advance because you've got to go through security. And I looked back at the line I was in just to get up to the sensors. There must have been 300 people in three lines side by side. And we were there very early. Uh, we get the 740 flight out. And so I'm saying you should upload, you know, the first team at each one of the security gates so that you can process these people for their flights. They had to come through and say, is there anyone leaving on the 7.05 a.m. flight? You know, and I'm saying, and we stood there long enough for the crew to change. And then it went faster, and I said, you know, if you've got all these people in line, then we ought to put the security force, really double it on the early morning flights. And these are the things that have to work down through the system. We're talking about investments for mm -hmm. the most part. But there are a lot of things that need to be done to make this a true working department that secures our homeland. So. We're not trying to throw all of this and get questions for you at one time. Where do we need to go? Yeah. And, you know, that might have been minor, uh, my experiences, but we do it every single week. And I'm saying by now, you know, we should have figured this out. So I understand it takes time, it takes money, and when we talk about growing government, we have to be sure that we use taxpayers' dollars wisely. So. We want you to tell us how to use those okay. <laughs> dollars wisely. Um, one of the things we're working on is, is right-sizing our workforce and the balance between federal yeah. and contractor employees. Our Senate Homeland Security Committee, this is a, was a bipartisan issue since the last Congress, and we have identified um, positions in DHS that would be more appropriately done by federal employees. That's going to be huge yeah. in delivering the mission effectively. And, and it's, it's not big government. It's doing the right thing and having our core capabilities done by federal employees. I think that the thing we have to do in acquisition and management is sustain the discipline and, and the tenacity to, to go through this. What we learn as children, decisions have consequences, and we have to be good and disciplined after we put the fundamentals in place about making the cost schedule and performance trade-offs so that um, we have a disciplined approach. Um, and if it means slowing down a program, that that's the right decision and that we have the, the, the uh, ability and the, the data to stand up and say we're purposefully slowing it down or um, whatever we're doing it to make the right decision. And I think that we have the building blocks in place and I think we have a great federal workforce in DHS. Um, I was a career fed for 26 years before my appointment and we have some of the finest people and I think we have the people to do it. Um, we have the leadership in place that will support them and I think that um, we, we do have the oversight of, of our committees that, that help because it helps us keep the focus on it. So I, my personal opinion after being in the department is the building blocks are in place and, and the proof is in, as both GAO and the IG have said, in the doing and the discipline to keep it up and, and have the discipline to make the hard decisions when they need to be made. We're going to send out uh, to you the questions that uh, were raised by Mr. Coyar and we'd appreciate the answers. And uh, if any other members of the committee would like to have any concerns or question answered, we, uh, we'll send them out to you. Madam yes, Chairman, Mr. Connolly. Madam Chairman, uh, uh, we, we will, with your consent, uh, submit some written questions for the record. Could I just add one little thing to Please do. your describing uh, your experience at uh, LAX? Uh, I, I would just plead with uh, DHS. It's, it may seem like a small thing, uh, but uh, Every time I've traveled, I've been impressed with uh, sort of a, an unevenness about uh, the training of handling the public. 
uh, by security personnel. Um, you know, it's just as easy, maybe even easier, to get compliance with hard-pressed travelers waiting in long lines, understanding that security is an issue, when there's a please affixed to the request. Um, I have been stunned at how many airports I go through where TSA folks act in ways that are profoundly disrespectful to the public, where they're barking orders and making commands, uh, and it's frankly just lack of training. And the public is not the adversary. Uh, the public is, in fact, just as, uh, as much uh, concerned about security as is TSA and wants to be cooperative, but it makes it a little harder, gets people's back up and creates unne needless stress when, frankly, we don't treat the public with the respect they mm -hmm. deserve. We're serving that public. And so I, I would plead with DHS to, it may seem like a little thing, but I don't think it is. Um, I think if you want the public's full cooperation, support, and sympathy for the mission, then treat them with the respect they deserve. And I, I would plead with you to start to uh, try to uh, have that, uh, that ethos uh, better imbued in, in the training programs and in the mentality of, of some of the folks who serve the public. Some are great and, and try to use good humor and treat people with respect, but all too many do not. And, uh, and you know, this is the United States of America. The public's in charge. You, uh, I'd have to uh, follow up on that, too, because that's what I was referring to. The TSA has to do a better job in selecting the people that work at first contact. Uh, you know, you go, you get your ticket, and then you get in that line. So th they really are the first contact, as far as I'm concerned. They yell continuously at people rather than saying, you know, take your shoes off and place them on the belt. That's what we have to do in L.A., here you can put them in the bend. And you know, it changes every airport you go in. But, and I can understand that. And, uh, but you really need to treat the public a little differently than we get treated. We travel twice a week, five hours and 15 minutes for me. And I, I said to them yesterday, you know, I'm going to see what we can do about making the, prog uh, the process more useful and smoother and not as antagonistic as it appears to be. I mean, that really irks me, someone who flies all the time. So anyway, I mean, that's minor, but it means a lot to the passengers. And uh, one of the things that annoys me is the personal conversation among the employees when there could be someone there who really needs to be checked out. And uh, I don't need to hear about what you did last night and uh, your personal problems and who is saying what. And that's the conversation you have to stand and listen to. So we need more focus. We need more, uh, shall I say, accuracy. And we need more detection, you know. And not everyone is an intended terrorist. Uh, but that's the way we treat it. But however, uh, that's rather minor, but it is an important issue to start thinking about. Uh, I want to say to the panel that we appreciate your input. And this is a hearing to gather information to make this particular service to the people, DHS, the best ever. Because you've heard the complaints out there in the streets. And it's like we are uh, the biggest, uh, shall I say, uh, interfering uh, big brother into people's business. We're growing government. And uh, we're endangering people's futures, uh, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. We're destroying our nation. That is not our intent. Our intent is to build the Department of Homeland Security to be the best in the world and to protect our country. And that's the reason why we're holding these hearings. I appreciate your input. And just know we're here to get the information that you need. And if we have to do it through policy, we'll do it that way. But I think these hearings will help us to uh, give the information out to you and let you handle it 
the best way, and I know we're driving the <laughs> CAO crazy, but anyway, we appreciate your feedback to us so we can manage the public's dollars better and have better results. And with that, if there are no more questions, uh, then we will adjourn this meeting. And thank you so much. Meeting is adjourned.